Greetings and welcome to No BS Baking. You got JP here. Now today I want to talk about dough conditioners or dough improvers. Where are these things? They're everywhere. They're in the flour that you buy from the store. They're in that bread mix that you just bought. They're in muffin mixes and cake mixes and everything that you could imagine. There's a lot of scary names that are attached to all of these things. Many people wonder, what are, what is this stuff? Is it good for me? Is it healthy for me? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to go through all of these things uh, and we're going to start today specifically with oxidizing agents and reducing agents. And so without further ado, let's go. Flour treatment, dough conditioner, improving agent, bread improver is generally defined as any ingredient or chemical added to flour or bread dough to improve it in some way. Dough conditioners may include enzymes, yeast nutrients, oxidants, reductants, bleaching agents, mineral salts, and emulsifiers. These are food additives designed to improve baking functionality processing considerations and overall baking performance. In this vid video we will cover off oxidation and reduction with a focus on a few of the more natural products you can use to improve your to improve your baked products. Keep in mind that the objective of this video is not to have everyone run out and buy micro measuring devices for adding some of these into your products but more so to teach you about the function of these so you can make decisions on what improver you may want to use to dial up your product to the next level. Millers and bakers have been adding oxidation and reduction agents into either the flour or directly into the dough for many, many years and still do to this day. These were added to improve the dough by making it stronger, giving it better gas retention, oven spring, proofing, machining tolerances, and to speed up the mixing process for productivity and temperature control reasons. Now, potassium bromate was the go-to add-in oxidizer for many years prior to the late 80s. Although it's still used in the U.S., various other countries, it has been banned in most developed Western countries, being that it contains a known carcinogen. Shortly after and during the transition out of bromate, ADA came on the scene promising to deliver baking performance similar to that of potassium bromate. Although it never really did attain the same standard as good old potassium bromate, it did a good job until it was found to also contain carcinogenic properties. And so it was banned in many countries, except once again for the U.S. and a number of other countries where it remains in use today. Always check your label. Now, there are a number of oxidants used in the baking and food industry which may appear on your ingredient uh, declaration. The chances are good that if they include things like peroxide, dioxide, iodate, bromate, or persulfate, somewhere in the chemical name, that they are oxidizers. Some are fast acting, some are slow, some provide powerful oxidation, some provide little some are good for some products and batters and cooking or other baking applications, some less so. So always good to know your, um, your products. As a more of a clean label oxidant, I've included enzyme active soy flour and glucose oxidase, oxidase which imparts a nice white crumb, adds additional dough strength to bread dough, and are almost always from natural sources. From the reduction side, uh, you can see the three reducing agents that I listed here. These are considered clean label additives, and although they're classified as reducing agents, they also can impart some oxidizing benefits and are often included in the list of oxidizing agents, such as ascorbic acid and, and uh, cysteine, respectively. So what do these do in a dough system? And how could I, the home baker, benefit from using some of these in my home baked bread dough? Well, let's talk about that. So what is this stuff and what does it have to do with me baking bread at home? Well, let's start by just looking at what is oxidation and reduction. Oxidizing agents are mostly used by the big bakeries uh, where producing consistent finished product is critical from day to day, month to month. 
So fluctuations in flour quality or other ingredients that they may use, uh, they need to add some type of security uh, system inside there so that they continue to produce consistent quality product that meets standards. So that is the reason why they, they often add this, uh, this additive in there. Now, further to this, we know from my recent video on flour protein and how strong bread flour appears on a farina graph curve, commercial bakers need to reduce mix times for both temperature control and productivity. Therefore, on both of these counts, oxidizing agents in the doughs sort this out. Now, from the reduction side of things, this is where the home baker can really benefit. Being that the home baker is not really obligated or care really too much about having perfectly uniform product that meets strict dimensional standards uh, that the baking companies demand, oxidation is generally not really as important. As I've mentioned in previous videos, one of the biggest mistakes home bakers make is underdeveloping their dough. Either it's not enough mix time to fully develop the dough, as shown here as the stability time in this, in this curve, and which is generally representative of a standard bread flour. Dough development is important for not only developing good gluten structure, but also to soften the dough so that it becomes extensible and producing a nice window pane, and ultimately giving you the good gas retention and ease of expansion in nice balance. Because home bakers rarely develop out their doughs properly, they have to rely on rest times and the, and the natural conditioning this provides to effectively soften the dough and create this extensibility and ultimately the, the nice gluten network to um, have a beautiful window pane. So let's look at this in more detail. Here we can see the main effects of both oxidation and reduction when added into the dough system. Besides the added strength due to the creation of these disulfide bonds in the gluten network, oxidation provides more rapid development and maturing of the gluten, creating a more elastic and softer dough which expands more easily, retaining gas better as a result. Now, regarding reduction, it's about increasing the speed at which the gluten develops and, and a rate at which softening occurs. For those who have watched my video on flour protein, then you understand stability time and the importance of the final stages of the curve as it drops back to the 500 line from peak. This is the all-important softening stage where gluten becomes more extensible, softer, and forms that nice window pane. Now, lack of development results in a dough that a window pane is difficult to produce without tearing. Your dough wants to tear, up, tear apart and not easily um, uh, stretch out. And this is why dough improvers are often used to reduce or eliminate rest time requirements, especially where a nice, tight, fluffy, and uniform crumb is required. Now, rest time conditions gluten, but keep in mind, these also age the dough, which if you're not carefully controlled, can result in other issues. So now you know the function of oxidation and reduction agents in basic dough or improvers or conditioners. So let's look at some of the home baking options that you can use and why you may find these useful. However, we'll stick with the clean label natural additives uh, in this video. First thing I'm going to talk about is ascorbic acid powder. It's commonly used by bakers around the world. Although actually classified as a reducing agent, it does impart some oxidizing benefits when used in an open system or exposed to oxygen. In closed systems, ascorbic acid performs as an, as an exceptional reducing agent. When using ascorbic acid, bakers can enjoy some of the benefits such as reduced mix time, improved dough consistency and strength, better gas retention, and improved overall volume and surface bursting where deemed desirable. Like when your product splits, you know, the ear for your sourdoughs and this type of stuff. You use very little in your dough, about 0.03% based on flour, will provide all the performance that you need for optimal results. Used in most any bread or rolls where bakers are looking for additional oomph out of their products, 
And although many bakers won't admit it, it's often used in long ferment breads like sourdough to give better volume, improved ear or the bursting um, during baking. Now, enzyme active soy flour, not to be confused with just soy flour, is often used by bakers for not only its dough conditioning benefits, but also as a nutritional enhancement by increasing the protein content of the product. Now, as we know already from previous videos, increased protein content does not necessarily translate into gluten forming proteins, and soy flour is definitely one that does not. As mentioned previous, Although this flour does not provide increased gluten, it does provide oxidation benefits that improve the overall performance of the dough. There are numerous other enzyme-related additives that can be used to condition dough. However, we'll dig into these later in my upcoming video on enzymes. Now, I also want to talk a little bit about glucose oxidase. It's a natural enzyme that acts as an oxidizing agent and is often used in bread production where natural ingredients are preferred. Uh, glucose oxidi oxidase, or GO, provides most of the common characteristics associated with using oxidizing agents like reduced mix times, bigger bread, stronger bread doughs, uh, that handle well and um, ultimately give you really nice uh, finished characteristics. Like ascorbic acid, you need very little of this enzyme for big results. General application rates of about 4 to 20 parts per million, which is almost crazy to try and measure at home. So I've included this one as one to watch for um, as a healthier oxidation additive when you're looking at store-bought dough improvers or conditions. Conditioners. If you're a tech nerd or have a scale that can measure micro amounts, then you can actually purchase this stuff online. But I'm going to talk a little bit about micro measuring as we move forward here. L-cysteine is an amino acid that reacts with some proteins, most predominantly operates as a reducing agent, providing shorter mix times by reducing the disulfide bonds, creating a more relaxed and softer dough. As you know, softer, more relaxed doughs expand easier and retain gas much better than untreated doughs, which have not softened enough through mechanical mixing. This product can be used in bread products and in many countries up to 90 parts per million. However, for most bread dough applications, half of this is satisfactory. Once again, at 0.009% based on flour, this is not normally used by the home baker in its raw form. However, it's available online in the event that you're looking at dough improvers uh, so that you can take a look and you can see what's in, inside your dough improver. There is no health issues related to the use of L-cysteine. However, inquisitive bakers may want to check the source of their product before deciding to use it. It is not vegetarian, being mostly made from animal sources. Some of those sources pe people may have an issue with. This product is commonly added into dough conditioners and improvers and used by bakers and bakeries around the world as a natural reducing agent. So maybe we want to try and make our own conditioner by fooling around with some of these micro additives that we just covered. We're going to start with ascorbic acid because it is a really nice reducing agent slash oxidizing agent and will give you unreal results with very small amount. Now we know that ascorbic acid provides optimal results at 0.03% based on flour, but how do you do it if you don't have a scale that will weigh such small amounts? Now for those of you who have watched my video on Baker's Math using ratio and proportion, then you'll quickly see how we can make ratio proportion work to solve this baking problem. The first thing we'll identify is how much ascorbic acid we'll need in our dough based on the quantity of flour. First thing we do is we'll set up our grid. We'll put grams on one side, percentage on the other. And for this example, I've decided to use 500 grams of flour in this recipe. We know that flour is always 100%, and so I placed the 100% there. Now, I want to add the full amount of ascorbic acid in there, and so I want to have 0.03% ascorbic acid for this amount of flour. So we just quickly do the math. 0.03 times 500 divided by 100 and we get 0.15 grams of ascorbic acid is needed to be added to this dough. 
So now that we've determined the, the amount of ascorbic acid, let's now work out the final calculations for creating a solution that will carry these micro measurements and allow us to translate it into something that we can work with. Now, in this example, I've used water as the carrier. However, flour obviously can also be used as in the case of most commercial bread improvers and conditioners on the market today. The principles are the same. So you can see over here that I put a container or a beaker with 100 milliliters of water in it. And I'm going to just for simple measurements, I'm going to add one gram of ascorbic acid into that 100 milliliters. But I want 0.15. That's what I need for my 500 grams of flour. So we quickly do the math here. We take 0.15 times 100 divided by 1 and we end up with 15 um, milliliters is what we will be required out of this 100 milliliter solution uh, in order to add into our dough to achieve our 0.03%. I hope that's not getting too confusing. Now, always remember you can use the, the little syringes and one cc is equal to one milliliter. So you would need 15 cc's translates into 15 milliliters. Now you could change the numbers and you could, you know, maybe put it into uh, 50 milliliters of water. You don't have to use 100. It's a little extra waste, but you could maybe store it in the fridge if you wanted to and use it next day baking. You can use a half a gram of ascorbic acid in there, you know, cut it back. But the calculation is the same. So the trick is mostly assuring that the target micro ingredient is evenly dispersed throughout the carrier with minimal separation or settling into, the con in into concentrated areas within the mix. So whatever you medium you use, make sure it's incorporated evenly, either through slow speed mixing as when you're using flour to be as your carrier um, or properly dissolved and agitated um, prior to use in the case of liquid mediums. So here you go. Quick way to do some calculations. Walk through things slowly. Make sure you, you put your headings on each side to not get confused. And this is a great way to um, be able to work with micro, uh, micro ingredients. I hope this video furthered your understanding of the effects of oxidation and reduction on dough rheology and the overall product performance. So now that we've reviewed oxidation and reduction, we can get rid of these and watch for the upcoming videos on the rest of the items listed here to further understand the effects and uses of many common baking ingredients found in dough conditioners, baking mi mixes, and are used independently to create uh, desired finished product, flavor, performance, and visual, visual characteristics you will be looking for. Thank you for watching the video. If you liked what you saw, please give me a like and a subscribe. It really helps me out as I'm getting this channel going here. And be sure to check out some of the other videos that I have sitting right over here. Uh, we'll see you next time. No BS breaking.